Today, my guest is Justin Stoddart. Justin is the host of the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. It's an educational platform for real estate professionals on how they can expand their mindset and business through masterminds, professional referral relationships, and media presence. And today we're going to talk about Think Bigger Real Estate. But first, a quick reminder, if you like the show, CREPN Radio, we would love to hear from you. You can like, share, and subscribe. And we always love to hear uh, the comments and, uh, from our listeners and tell us what you think of the show. Also, want to remind you, if you'd like to see how attractive our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Justin. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thanks, Darren. It's a, it's a total pleasure to, uh, to be here. Thank you for the invite. Well, I am uh, delighted to have you and looking forward to our talk today. Uh, before we get started, if you could just take a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Yeah, you bet. Uh, you know, Darren, I was raised in a very entrepreneurial family and uh, went into the home building industry while in college. I uh, was a high-end home builder uh, for somebody else. The person who I'd, who I'd gone to work for uh, had, had leveraged his company uh, pretty significantly or had leveraged himself in order to get into more uh, spec homes at really an inopportune time as the market had started to tip. Uh, by that point, I was overseeing the custom home division. It was all pre-sold properties and I had the relationship with the clients. And so I made an offer uh, to him and his new partners to buy out that division of the company. So I then proceeded forward and uh, ran a high-end custom home business for the next number of years until really kind of all markets were affected. As we all remember the crash of 2007, eight, nine, um, it was a, 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 a tough time. And uh, yet I look back and it was, it was an amazing time because it really helped me to identify what it is that I loved in business and what it is that I did not love in business. I realized that I did, I did not love building homes, uh, but my passion really was building people and building business, business development. And that became uh, kind of moving forward a theme and a trend throughout, and uh, has been throughout my career. And I was recruited into the title and escrow industry to be a business development officer uh, simply for the fact that I've uh, owned, and, owned and run businesses and uh, I can have a conversation with real estate professionals um, that maybe is not common in the title and escrow world. Uh, most have been employees most of their career. So being able to have a business level conversation um, has been kind of a differentiator um, in my book of business, uh, which has led me to you know, the good opportunity to work with a lot of, of higher producing professionals. Because once they get over a certain point, Darren, their business is not uh, just about real estate. It's really about business. And it's about how to scale a business and how to um, you know, really grow an operation and a brand. And so um, it was a few years ago that I decided to um, get into the uh, media space and began a podcast. Um, at the beginning of this year, I pivoted to really make that podcast be very specific to real estate professionals. It was a little more general, a little more broad as I started. And I started to realize like, my, the, the audience that I really love and that I really want to serve and that I feel like could use some leadership at a really interesting time. Uh, meaning with all the disruptors coming into the real estate space, um, it's, it's in need of leadership. And so uh, that was where kind of the, the pivoted or 2.0 version of the podcast, which is the, real, the big Think Bigger Real Estate Show, um, came about. And I have the good fortune of, of interviewing people that are um, way smarter and way more successful than I am, which uh, my hope and intent is that that will rub off on me. And uh, I, I have a blast doing it. A um, little personal background. I've got a, um, a superhero wife because together we have six children and uh, ages 12 down to one. So um, we think bigger at home and at work. <laughs> wow. No, that's, that's awesome. It's amazing. She lets you leave, uh, leave the house. Or that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, so. I, I, was actually, I was actually joking yesterday. I get a call about 4.15 every day. What time are you going to be home tonight? She just plants <laughs> the seed like... Please don't make it a late evening. I'm ready for some help. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's awesome. I uh, appreciate you sharing that, and congratulations to you and your family. That's, that's, uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, Think Bigger and some of the things that you've learned. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, may, maybe the, the place to start would be, um, I mean, let me back up here. If I understood right, basically it's, it's a platform where you're doing these interviews and you're talking with people. Yeah. Um, what are some of the things, or maybe what's, 
you know, can you describe a, a, what people have been doing uh, and what you're seeing that they're doing and maybe how they're uh, integrating some of these things and how it's affecting their business? Is that kind of a, a fair? I think a common trend of those, uh, Darren, that I see really moving their business forward in this era is they're, they're, they're realizing that although the internet can produce a lot of lead opportunities, it's not always the best type of business. Uh, and I've got agents who spend a lot of money, the customers even that spend a lot of money um, on Zillow leads and, and, and other forms of business. Um, and and I, I think that that's not always a bad idea. I think the challenge becomes when agents get leveraged by the tech flat platforms as opposed to leveraging the tech, the, the, you know, the tech platforms. I believe that um, um, Zillow's goal, using them as an example, is really to become the Amazon.com of the real estate industry. And what I mean by that is if you look at, um, in fact, I'll ask you this question, Darren, um, have you purchased something from Amazon in the past uh, couple of weeks or month? I'm probably not the best ask, but I can say that I've in the last couple of months, I know I've okay. books okay, or whatever great. kind of, yeah. Do you remember uh, the actual company that you purchased that, that actually manufactured the product or do you just remember that it came from Amazon? It, yeah, it was a book. So I, I can't remember. I, okay. So when I asked that question, most people they're like, yeah, I purchased something in the past couple of weeks and they know exactly what it was, but they don't even know who the manufacturer was. To them, that's almost irrelevant. The, like what they care about, it was, it was, it was came from Amazon, it got there in two days, and they had good reviews, right, is what they remember. And I believe that Zillow's aim, although they're currently friends of real estate right now, and, and I know your audience is, is more commercial brokers, and I believe that there are uh, similar platforms working to really offer leads and opportunities to commercial brokers, um, but the, the, the concept um, with Zillow's efforts, again, is to make the agent, uh, to make it to where they, to, to where Zillow owns the customer and the agent is irrelevant, right? Similar to how when we go buy something on Amazon, we're really a customer of Amazon, right? They own us. And when we go back to buy something again, we're not going to go back to that manufacturer that actually was on Amazon's marketplace. We don't necessarily care about that, that particular company. Our relationship's not with them, it's with Amazon. So the marketplace actually precedes the actual service provider. And I think Zillow's ideal goal would be that when people think real estate, they go to Zillow and whoever the agent is there, it's irrelevant as long as they've got good reviews and can get there in 20 minutes to open the door, great. So I see these tech platforms uh, moving to really commoditize the work of service-based professionals. And so to answer your question, those that I think that are, that are um, implementing it and thinking bigger, and, and uh, first of all, they're growing themselves and they're growing their value to the customer. You know, in this day and age where there's so much competition, and again, competition not just with the person down the road, but with, you know, actually with Wall Street back and venture back tech companies, that they have to be increasing their value proposition. The, act, the customer has to be able to, like number one, recognize that there's a difference between a tech platform and them, and they, and, and they have to be able to actually believe that there's an ROI on the fact that maybe that person is gonna cost a little bit more than the tech, tech platform. So the people that are really thinking about not how can I creatively uh, market myself to get the customer to think that I'm more valuable or be leveraged by the tech, tech platforms, but the agents that are really doubling down on how do I actually bring more value? How do I actually become a wealth determiner for my clients? Um, are the ones that I believe are not only succeeding now, but they'll actually have a place at the table in the future. <clears throat> no, I appreciate the, the comparison there. I think the Amazon, uh, you know, is almost a verb anymore. You know, the, the Amazon effect um, yeah. with uh, all sorts of small businesses. And it's, you know, kind of like before that, I think it was the Walmart uh, yeah. effect, you know, in small towns, how they basically put small, uh, businesses out of business based on the ability to deliver low cost goods. Uh, and I think probably in Amazon, it's kind of a convenience thing. And I would, you know, as far as the, the Zillow example, um, I wonder if, if this, and, and this is sometimes I, I think that uh, because things are in, in flux or there's change that I think there's a natural tendency to uh, 
imagine that there'll be a time when we won't be needed or, you know, if that's, it's going to, you know, take from your uh, opportunity. And then I think there's a, there's a flip side of that. And I'm, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on this as far as maybe just like a repositioning of your, of the way you do business, because I would, I would say just from an experience space is that the, the Zillow for myself, if I were looking for a home and I typed in, you know, whatever the neighborhood or the city that I was wanting to look at a home, it's, it's a, it's a portal for me to at least get a feel for what, what is, and probably also see who is on, on that site. Um, but I can't imagine going to the shopping cart and, you know, buying a home. Do you see it going that far to where the, where the, uh, there's no need for a, a, I mean, is that, do you, do you, do you believe that that will eventually happen? I've, I've had agents for, um, you know, for the past five years that I've been in, in the Thailand escrow industry, they've always pointed to the fact that, you know, the, the Zillow Zestimate is most of the time, like in fact, when it, when I got started, it was like, you know, like 90% of the time that thing's dead wrong. Um, and it's interesting now that I've heard agents say yeah, it's right about 50, 60, sometimes 75% of the time. Um, I don't know that there'll ever be a time. There's so many variables to say that like that, that tool is going to be a hundred percent right all the time, especially when you don't have an area that isn't filled with cookie cutter homes, right? In, right. in Portland, we're, uh, we're a little bit unique in the sense that we have some unique neighborhoods and, and et cetera. Whereas if you go down to like Phoenix, where you have, you know, mass sprawl neighborhoods where everything is very, very uniform. Um, I could see there coming a point where it gets much, you know, simplified, so my point with that isn't that the Zestimate um, answers that question, but I think what it does answer is a couple things are happening. Is that um, the technology is, is getting better and it's going to continue to get better and it will always continue to get better. And so I think if we rely on the false um, notion that um, it, it will never be able to do, uh, you know, accurate work, I think, I think we'll see that it will. Um, I think where the opportunity lies and to your point is can, you ever go to a shopping cart and check out and, and actually not deal with a human being. Um, you know, to some degree that's kind of happening, you know, um, in the sense that there's, you know, these, these, and, and it's not to that extreme, but I, I believe that there will always be humans needed right in, in the process. Um, and Gary Keller who, who founded Keller Williams owns Keller Williams. Um, you know, he says that there's a couple options moving forward. There's to have agent enabled tech. In other words, tech is the servant and helps improve the value that a human can bring. Or you'll have an industry that's filled with technology that's simply run by, um, by low paid humans. Almost like I compare it to like a barista running a cappuccino machine, right? That the technology is so good that the human behind right. it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, and and I, I hope that the industry doesn't go that way because I think it will be to the detriment of the customer. And I think that it, it will go that way to some degree, but there are those that will find ways to add real value that actually determines wealth for the customer. And I believe that those people will carve out a profitable niche, very similar to how um, I'm actually writing um, kind of a, a book on this topic. And one thing that I've, I've identified is, um, you know, well-paid travel agents still exist. We always kind of pick on travel agents like, oh, we don't want to go the way of travel agents. I had a friend who was telling me a, a story about, um, he and his wife were booking a trip to Europe and he's like, Oh, I can do this. Got online and he was just bombarded with reviews and like, there's so many options. And finally he was like, you know, I get to do this one time. This is a big deal. And uh, he realized that even though there was so many options, he just needed someone who'd done it before and someone who he could trust. And um, he was willing to pay the money to not mess up the trip. And I think to some degree that's, that's, you know, most travel agents on very simple um, transactions and booking a flight here, booking a hotel there. Yeah, they're not necessary, right? But right. when it comes to really determining wealth and getting it right on, and in bigger matters, I think that's where there will always be opportunity for the right people. Well, I think it's a great analogy because I was trying to describe to my kids the other day about how we used to go to a travel agent to buy a ticket, you know, just to, yeah. for us, a little trip kind of thing, you know, and, yeah. and they were like, a what? <laughs> uh, but but no, on, on something that's more intricate and more specialized and something that's a little outside of the norm, I would think that the, you know, somebody that has that expertise would be that much more valuable. And, um, 
I mean, I think it's a great analogy for this. Cause I, I think that's kind of what I see with a lot of technology is it's like, even at the, the, the grocery store, the uh, self checkout line, you know, I can remember the first time I saw it, like, why would anybody do that? Now it's like, if I only got a few items, you bet I'm headed right there. I just, I want to get in and get out. I, I got places to go. People to see, you know, kind of thing. Um, so I think there's, there are some of those tasks that I, I, it would make sense that will, um, you know, be, given to tech, but I think that if you really want to get in and understand the details, I would think that that having that expert there that, that, um, you know, has some sort of a background or experience or whatever that can help you navigate that, uh, will always be of value. I would, I would hope, yeah. um, cause that's kind of the same, same business, like for the insurance, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that we do yeah. that, that, uh, people feel like they'd rather just go point and click. Um, but as you get, get up the food chain a little bit, there's a little bit more of a concern of, of that uh, personal interaction. Um, so, so let's talk about some of the ways that, that you're seeing that, that um, uh, real estate brokers or agents are uh, leveraging tech uh, to position themselves and bring value. Yeah, great question. You know, I think any technology that, that, you know, there's functionary tasks and then there's fiduciary tasks, right? Wealth advisors understand that term as do real estate agents and brokers <clears throat> that fiduciary tasks are those that, that, um, you know, as, as a fiduciary, your responsibility is to, uh, make decisions on behalf of the client that put their interests ahead of yours. And I think when it comes to fiduciary tasks, where you're actually acting um, in ways that preserve and promote the wealth of your client, I think, that's where agents need to stay. And interesting, you know, the National Association of Realtors uh, did a study and showed, it was between 80 to 90% of the time, real estate agents are working on functionary tasks. In other words, there's a lot to do when it comes to, you know, listing a property, whether it be signs, lock boxes, flyers, um, you know, different marketing pieces. Like all these things are super, um, you know, they're, they're necessary, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that it needs to be the broker, right? And so I think agents that leverage other people, other systems or other tools in order to take care of the functionary so that they can spend as much of their day, 80% of their day on those 20% activities. I think those, that's where it makes sense. So I, so to answer your question, any technology that takes functionary tasks off their plate, right? Whether it be data entry, uh, whether it be, um, you know, running reports that they can then interpret for the client and apply and customize to the client. Um, that's where I think, again, to, you know, to your point earlier of like, you hope that, you know, we both hope that there's a place at the table for real estate brokers in the future. And I think that's the place at the table. It's, there will be enormous amounts of data and even insights from that, but it's then taking that and applying it to that customer specific situation and help helping them make decisions that preserve and promote their wealth and their, you know, well-being. That's where I think the opportunity is at. So kind of a broad answer, but any tech that again takes those functionary tasks off the plate of a realtor so that they can focus on the fiduciary um, is is, you know, what I think, you know, where things need to go. And agents that are succeeding are going. Got it. And so as far as the, the functionary task, and I I love that word because it I mean it describes a lot of just the the uh monotonous kind of has to be done yep. uh, kind of thing, but just the data collection or filling forms or, um, you know, just all the, the administrative kind of things that don't, that aren't out of the ordinary, but just have to be in order for the transaction. Um, so I, I guess I, I want to get a, a feel for a little bit, or I'd like to get a little uh, more uh, from you is to, what, what are you seeing that your, um, th that uh, agents and brokers are doing to bring more value? Because obviously if, if I can put all this, these uh, low level tasks over to technology, uh, freeing myself up to be more available and bring more value. W can you point to some examples of what, what uh, brokers are doing? and or how they're utilizing the tech for that? Yeah, a couple of things. So I think it comes down to um, first and foremost, people don't know how much, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? So I think 
a big part of the business still is building personal relationships with people, not necessarily just to schmooze and get the business, right? Sometimes that's kind of feels to, to some people inauthentic. Um, it, it can't be inauthentic for it to actually work. But the goal is not to necessarily just schmooze people for business. The goal is actually to listen for wants and needs, to actually be close enough in proximity that you are able to serve them at a higher level. You know, that uh, real estate and anything, most things are not a one size fits all. And in order for you to be able to truly serve the customer at a high level, uh, there has to be, you have to have an understanding of what that customer wants, what their needs are, what their plans are one year, five years, 10, 15 years from now, you know, um, like where are they headed and then customize, um, your advice to that client. I think that's a critical component. And at that point, once, once you know, and a big portion of all of this is just asking the right questions and enough questions, right? We tend as salespeople tend to talk a lot and we want to tell people all about why we're successful and why we have all these little initials behind our name and how many clients we've served and how many, how many, um, times we've been in the top 10% or 1% of brokers. And I think there's a, there's a place for that. People need to validate the fact that you, that there is evidence that you've been successful and helped other people. But I think more important than that, and even more traction will be earned by agents and brokers who are more concerned about where their clients are headed and what their successes are, what their challenges are. If you can, this is going to sound crass, but allow me to finish. Um, Darren Hardy, one of my mentors said, you need to be in bed with your clients. And, and he said, he said, no, let me explain. What I mean by that is like, what's keeping them awake at night? If you can identify what is, what is keeping them awake at night, um, then you can go to work on that. That's what he means by that topic. So, um, but the, the, I, I think that's foundational and, and, and fundamental is actually spend the time asking good questions uh, a lot of agents, it's, it's, it tends to be very surface level. And I get that when you have a large database of people that you're trying to serve, uh, that gets hard. So I think one necessary component of that is actually prioritizing your database and knowing to whom should get that preferential treatment. Because you won't be able to do that with a, a you know, database of 300 people. It's just not enough time in the day. Uh, but you can do it with 10. Right? You can do it with 15, 20 have regular conversations with people that really dig into what's happening in their life. At that point, people know you care. And then, you know, the next step is really to become a master of, um, of, of, of your craft. Be really good um, at knowing not just where things are at and where things have been, but where things are going. Being a fortune teller to some degree uh, becomes critical to then be able to lead and guide. I mean, sales at its highest form is leadership. And if you can lead your clients to the place ultimately they want to go, I think you'll have a loyal client for a long time. No, I, I love that answer, uh, the, the knowledge, because I think that uh, in my business, and I'm sure in real estate as well, it's really easy to get caught up in that you know, functional task. Yeah. And um, you're not, you know, if you're, if you're doing that, you're not able to uh, spend your time reading and thinking and, and trying to, you know, forecast or, you know, find out where things are going to where you can properly lead your client and uh, provide them some direction that will be useful and help them to, you know, take advantage of what's coming or whatever. And, and um, so I think that is a, that's an excellent um, uh, answer. You know, it's funny when, when um, I was um, uh, setting up this, this uh, call for us today, I had the sense of that we'd be talking a lot about how to, you know, use Facebook and all these other things. But reality is, is that that may be the, the, the platform, I guess, whatever anybody wants to, to utilize, but you're really getting down to the core of what are you going to do when you get there? And, and you know, what do the people want to hear? What, what, what do the people need? And like, like you said that, you know, starting with listening and asking good questions and then trying to, uh, be a value with, with knowledge and stuff. I think that's, that's a, a, a that's, that's great. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of emphasis and for good reason of these, the study of these platforms. Um, 
and I, I, I see them simply as a way to distribute value. But if the value is, you know, I think one form of value could be the fact of how to master the platforms. Um, but I guess for me and, and, and for you, that's not where our, our secret sauce is at or our values at. They, they're, they're just a means to deliver a message to a group of people, right? Right, right, right. No, and I think that's, that's again, the, if sitting there listening, it's going like, <clears throat> you know, this is exactly what people need to do is to, to truly be that expert in their field is to, you know, spend the time, uh, you know, learning what's, what's coming and then asking, you know, your, your clients or prospects what, what their needs are. And, and, and like you said, getting in the bed with them so that you have that sense of what they're, what's keeping them up at night. And, um, I mean, that's, that's great. Um, so I, I'm curious, can you uh, point to anybody that you, you know of who perhaps wasn't working this way and then all of a sudden, you know, started, um, you know, really kind of digging in and trying to become more value? And is there any kind of a comparison to their, their before and after results? Or um, That's a great question, Darren. Nobody specifically comes to mind. I know probably all of us are on a little bit of a different journey in getting there. It seems like it's not like a, I was working in the dark and now I'm working in the light, right? It's kind of like this natural right. progression that people kind of go through of like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, to where maybe over the period of time, you know, but um, I think probably the, um, the people that are able to do this, and, and I apologize, I probably can't answer your question uh, uh, how you want to, but the people that have that do that the most are the ones that recognize that they need to hire some help, right? That they, um, they can't do it all. I've got one client that sells over a hundred homes a year and, um, had no personal assistant. <laughs> wow. And, uh, now granted she had help, has help with her paperwork and has some help on marketing. Uh, but just recently, you know, recently hired an intern, and it's been interesting how now she's able to engage with me in more of these strategic conversations on how to add more value to our customers. And before it was always like, I can't, I can't, I can't, um, you know, just kind of like run around with her hair, her hair on fire, which rightfully so, right? I mean, most people can't even fathom of doing that much work as a, as a very small team or very, you know, even solo agent. Um, but this, the minute that she hired somebody that was, you know, um, getting paid not just with money, but with experience, right? So their, their um, salary or pay was, was, was lower, right? Because they're not super experienced yet. But for her to be able to take some of those tasks and put it on that person's plate, when I started to see her marketing improve and become more genuine and uh, more of it, um, and now she's engaging more in, in, in the strategic side. And so um, kind of a roundabout way of, of, of answering your question. No, I, I think that's a great example. Um, you know, I think there's uh, plenty of people that get into business and they're good at it. And uh, there's not a sense of uh, uh, delegation or the, they don't always have the, the recognition or the, uh, the skill set even to delegate. It's yeah. a matter of they, they recognize how to do it and they just get in and get things done. But eventually they do run into the a capacity issue and that there's only so many hours in the day. And, uh, so to, to have that complete understanding and to be able to, to, you know, provide clear, uh, instructions to someone to where they can fill those roles, uh, is, you know, it, it's a, a talent. It's, it's, a you know, there's going to be some trial and error, but the quicker somebody's able to do that, I believe the, uh, the more success they're likely to have. That's, that's good. Hey, Justin, um, I want to shift gears here if we could. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned to you uh, kind of before the call started, uh, by day I'm an insurance broker. And um, one of the things we do is risk management. And uh, there's a couple of different strategies we employ. One is uh, we can avoid the risk. Uh, two is we can minimize the risk. Or three, we can transfer the risk. And a lot of times that's done through contracts or insurance uh, policies. And uh, so I've, I've been asking all of my guests if they could take a look at their business and, uh, you know, their clients and, 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 and basically if they could, you know, identify what they see as the biggest risk. And so I want to ask you, 
if you could identify what you see is the, the biggest risk? You know, I think uh, actually interviewed a gal yesterday and she said, I asked her the question, which is kind of my signature question at the end of my shows, which is um, what do you do to intentionally think bigger? And uh, I think it's a great response actually for your question. She said, um, I work to, I work really hard to avoid complacency. And I think the biggest risk that all of us face in a world that's rapidly innovating and rapidly moving forward is to get complacent with our own personal growth and our own personal network. And I'm going to put a, a plug for you. You didn't ask for this, um, but to have somebody who's, whose business is insurance, but goes about adding value to their clients, um, really modeling uh, media, modeling marketing in its, its high, highest form. Um, I think it's, it's brilliant on your part because you're becoming a much more, even if nobody listens to this, I know that's not true. We had this conversation before. You've got a, a great audience. It's um, just the, the person that you're becoming by having these conversations just makes you, when you show up with a customer, you're so much more valuable to them than had you just been going about as a typical insurance agent. And so I would encourage anybody who's listening, the, big, the, the biggest risk that you have is to not surround yourself with you know, partners like Darren and knowledge that's helping you grow and your business grow. Because we can get really complacent and say, oh, I've had such and such for so many years and uh, you know, they're, they, you know, they, you know, they've done fine. Which I'm all about loyalty, don't get me wrong. Like I'm not, uh, but, but what I am saying is all of us need to be aggressively seeking out um, how to grow ourselves and grow the value to our customers. And sometimes that entails uh, actually taking a look at our partnerships to say, are these people becoming somebody that can lead me? Are these people uh, be growing a network that can be of value to me and my customers as the competition stiffens? So not growing and being complacent, I think, is the biggest risk. No, I appreciate that. And I, I think there are, uh, there's a lot to that. And, and, uh, you know, if you're not learning, you're, uh, you're, I don't know how to say dying, but you're, you're certainly not getting ahead and, uh, you know, being, uh, being complacent in this marketplace is a good way to get run over. So that's great. Um, Justin, uh, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, so my uh, website is thinkbigger.realestate. And I actually have a, um, an, an ebook that's, in, that's being edited right now. I just actually signed a deal with a publisher um, that uh, should be done in a few months, probably six months at the most, of actually turning that ebook into um, an, an actual um, hardcover book, softcover book, whatever the kind of book we decide. Um, but uh, it will be about helping real estate agents navigate this new world and be less salesperson, more advisor. Um, and the tactical will be helping them get business from and, and give business to other professionals. Uh, so um, yeah, fo follow me there. I think bigger dot real estate um, is where I'd go and uh, people can opt in um, as early as probably later this week to get updates on my show um, and kind of stay attuned as to different book releases. So Awesome. Well, I will post that in the show notes. And uh, again, I want to say, Justin, thanks for uh, taking the time today. I've uh, enjoyed our, our time together and learned a lot. And I uh, hope we can do it again soon. I'd love that, Darren. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, your, your clients and your audience are fortunate to have someone, someone leading the charge like you. So thanks again for the opportunity. All right. Thank you. And for our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.